A feather and a hammer dropped and left on the moon may be seen to represent thousands of years of development of thinking towards our modern understanding of nature. Understanding nature is the topic of physics. And any study of physics typically starts with the study of mechanics. This video prepares such studies by looking at the foundations of physics. The hammer and the feather, indicated in the picture by blue and red arrows, were left there by Apollo astronauts. They reenacted a famous experiment that takes us back to the time of the ancient Greeks, to the time of Aristotle. From birth onwards, we experience the world in motion. When we crawl as a baby, for example, or at rest, when we sit, as you might do now. It is not surprising that we have always wanted to understand what distinguishes these two fundamental states of our existence, motion and rest. Physics gives us the answers. The name of the science of physics has its origins in ancient Greek. It is believed to have been derived from the expression physica episteme, which I've written down here in Greek lettering. It means in English, knowledge of nature. Since its origins in ancient Greece, physics has undergone a dramatic development, in particular since the work by Galilei and Newton that has brought about our modern understanding of physics. And we now say that physics is about the fundamental principles that underpin nature, with a focus on forces and on energy. Physics is a foundation science for other disciplines, such as chemistry, biology and engineering. Physics thrives on the interplay of experimentation and measurement on one hand, and theoretical modeling on the other hand. The language of physics is mathematics. Physics ideas are communicated using mathematics. The foundation of physics developed by Galilei and Newton has allowed us to travel to the moon and back, which is dramatically demonstrated by this photograph which shows the earth rise and the landing module returning to the control module before docking and returning to our planet photographed over the moon's surface. The motion of moon and earth with respect to each other, the mutual attraction of these two large massive objects are described by the same physical laws as founded by Newton and the same mechanics that is applied to the motion of the two Apollo modules and their return to Earth. The physics that we know today is universal and it describes nature in the same way as it drives the technologies that we for example use for space exploration. While humans will have always contemplated nature and would have sought explanations, a distinct starting point of the science of physics may have been the academic and published work by Aristotle. Aristotle introduced the two concepts motion and force that are still very important in our discussion of physics. They are at the heart of the discipline of kinematics, which is a discipline of physics, and force is at the center of the discipline of dynamics, which is a part of physics. Aristotle also theorized and speculated about possible relationships between forces and objects and motion. He tried to understand what causes the motion of objects. Importantly, however, in striking contrast to our modern approach, Aristotle's physics did not involve any experimentation or any measurement, and it was restricted to logical, philosophical thought. As we will see in a moment, this drastically limited Aristotle's achievements and resulted in misconceptions. Aristotle lived from 384 to 322 before the Common Era, and his thinking was grounded in the idea that every object has a natural place on Earth, so that water droplets, for example, will find their way to their natural place, which is the rivers and the oceans, because the force drives them there. On the other hand, steam, vapor, will go up to the clouds because the atmosphere higher up than the water, than the rivers, will be the natural place and therefore there is a force driving 
that vapor upward. Aristotle also concluded that motion requires a force and that heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects. As you'll see in a moment, these ideas are not correct. However, Aristotle's ideas nevertheless persisted for almost 2,000 years. If some of these ideas are clearly wrong, the question arises if any of these ideas are still acceptable, and why did Aristotle fail at giving a better, a correct description of nature? Due to its age-old history and the need to express many different parameters, in the mathematical formulation of physics, Greek letters have an important role in physics, and even modern students are expected to know them. Below is the depiction of the Greek alphabet, with alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, and so on. And uh, on the right there is a list of only some parameters in physics that are expressed with Greek lettering. For example, rho represents density, Capital Phi represents physics as a whole, as a discipline. Theta is often used as an angle of displacement. Pi, of course, represents the number 3.141 and so on. And Psi is the wave function in quantum mechanics. Lambda is often the wavelength. Alpha, Beta, Gamma are used to express angles. And uh, the letter capital Delta expresses often a difference or is used to express uncertainty. It may not be immediately obvious that physics is a foundation for all the other disciplines of science. This is in particular so because of the concept of force, which is at the heart of mechanics, and it is present in many other aspects of science and engineering. Electrical engineering considers charges and electric fields. An electron, for example, a name that also has its origin in ancient Greek and uh, expressed here in its Greek lettering as uh, eta, lambda, epsilon, kappa, tau, rho, omicron and nu experiences a force in an electric field. The electron is decelerated by the force of the electric field that is drawn here because it's repelled by the negative charges on the right hand plate and it may stop in other words, its velocity and momentum become zero. The force causes a momentum change. That is a statement straight from mechanics. In addition to considering forces, physics in mechanics discusses motion by considering the concept of kinetic energy. And this is relevant for chemistry. This concept is in chemistry, for example, important in the description of the temperature, the microscopic description of the temperature of a gas, shown here in particular for a monoatomic gas. In a particular volume, as sketched here, the gas molecules move about with a certain velocity. Since they have mass, they therefore also have kinetic energy. The mean kinetic energy of a gas molecule is given as one half mass times the mean velocity squared. And it can be shown in a detailed treatment that this is equal to one half times a natural constant, the Boltzmann constant, Kb, times the temperature. So the concept of kinetic energy relates the macroscopic parameter temperature, which is crucial in the discussion of gases, with the microscopic motion of the gas molecules. And the average velocity is therefore the square root of Boltzmann constant times temperature divided by the mass of the gas molecule. It is fascinating to realize that Aristotle's misconceived arguments survive for a relatively long time. As pointed out, Aristotle argued that massive objects such as a rock fall faster than less massive ones such as a feather. In contrast to such natural motion, he also considered what he called an unnatural, violent motion, which involved a perpetual force to maintain the speed. Centuries later, this was still the only foundation for physical thought, and military engineers in the 16th century tried to use this to explain the trajectory of a cannonball, as illustrated by the sketch on the right. Following Aristotle, 
the cannonball is first driven by an unnatural violent motion on a straight line and driven by a perpetual force until the energy of that motion is expeded. Then at point F the natural motion takes over which returns the cannonball in a straight line back to its natural place on the ground. Clearly it was about time that the many mistakes in this thinking had to be corrected and that was achieved by Galileo Galilei. Galileo Galilei lived from 1564 to 1642 and corrected many of the misconceptions of Aristotle. For example, he pointed out that while in air a hammer or a rock would fall faster than a feather, that however in vacuum if the air was removed, where there is no drag and no friction, both would fall the same. This has now been demonstrated many, many times and most spectacularly by the Apollo astronauts on the moon, as sketched in the cartoon on the top right and alluded to by the photo on the first slide of this presentation. How did Galileo Galileo manage to overthrow Aristotle's thinking that was so ingrained in the medieval world and survived for 2000 years? The key to his success was that he did not limit himself to theorizing, but combined theory with measurement, with careful experimentation. That commenced our modern empirical science, where a theoretical hypothesis is checked by measurement and an unexpected measurement result is modeled using theory. It is this productive interplay of theory and experiment that drives science forward on a correct path. Galileo's most important experimental work in this context involved inclined planes and rolling balls. First he used his pulse, then water clocks as illustrated here, to measure the time intervals. The experimental setup is illustrated schematically here. A rolling ball passes certain checkpoints 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and the time the ball takes between those checkpoints is measured using the water dripping into a beaker that then is weighed. The concept seems simple from a modern perspective but it was ingenious at the time because there were no clocks available to measure the free fall of a ball and a ball on a horizontal plane is just at rest without any force. So placing the ball on a slightly inclined plane creates a situation that is in between horizontal and perpendicular and creates a motion that is relatively slow though, so that it can be timed using a water clock. Galileo's experiment showed that the ball passes the checkpoint such that the displacement x is proportional to the time squared. One might argue that this may be the first experimental result ever achieved in physics. Theoretically, one might look at the situation drawing a vector diagram. The ball is driven downwards, accelerated downwards, by gravity, by a component of gravity, the component that is parallel to the inclined plane, as illustrated on the top left. This produces a constant acceleration. This component of gravity, parallel to the plane, increases with the tilt angle. The steeper the plane, the faster the ball will accelerate. In general, the position x, the displacement x along the plane, will depend on time t and acceleration a. It is now possible to use the concept of dimensional analysis to get an idea how displacement x, acceleration a and time t are related. That is illustrated at the bottom. Displacement has the dimension of length and the unit meter. Time on the right hand side has the unit seconds and um, it might go into the relationship with a certain exponent. That exponent beta might be 1, it might be 2, we don't know at this point. Displacement is also related to acceleration and acceleration is meters per second squared and um, it might have an exponent alpha. So combining now the two units using alpha and beta equals 1, we find that meter on second squared times second gives us meter on second, 
which is the, the dimension of velocity but not the dimension of displacement. So this is not correct. However, if we pick beta equals to 2, we have meters on second squared to the power of alpha equals 1 times second to the power of beta equals 2. Then the two second squared cancel and we obtain the dimension of length in the unit meter. So this is correct. This is the correct dimension. So therefore we can then speculate that acceleration goes into this relationship to the power of 1 and time goes into this relationship to the power of 2. Galileo documented his experimental work that was carried out in Padua in Italy in his book Discorsi. No equipment or relics survived. However, in 1841, he was honored with the fresco. The sketch was made in preparation for this fresco and also shows Galileo's sponsor. In fact, it's meant to be a demonstration of the experiments using the inclined plane to this sponsor. In drawing his conclusions about motion down the plane, Galileo neglected the effects of air resistance, friction, and also of the rolling motion of the ball. In this context he was fortunate because all effects do not fundamentally change the outcome of the experiment. The rotation of the ball and the effects of friction both cause a small but a constant reduction of the downward acceleration so that the principle of constant acceleration is not affected. So the actual acceleration A is somewhat smaller than the theoretically expected acceleration g, which is gravity, times the sine of the tilt angle. The cartoons at the bottom show some modern data for this type of experiment. For different tilt angles alpha, 10 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees and 60 degrees. Shown is the total distance traveled by the ball in one second and the positions reached at equal time intervals of 0.2 seconds. It is apparent that the total distance traveled increases from 0.85 meters at 10 degrees to 4.24 meters at a tilt angle of 60 degrees. For equal time intervals, the displacement intervals are not constant, they increase. The displacement intervals are smallest for the small tilt angle and the small acceleration and they are largest for the steep tilt angle with the large acceleration. The acceleration of the balls thus increases with tilt angle. An important conclusion is that for a zero tilt angle, alpha equals zero, one would expect that the acceleration tends to zero. This is in line with theory since for a horizontal plane there is no component of gravity acting parallel to the plane. Combining his theoretical considerations with his experimental measurements, Galileo can reach a conclusive result, namely that the position of the ball along the inclined plane is always given by one half times acceleration times time squared x equals one half a t squared. Such equations are known as the law of motion and x equals one half a t squared is the law of constantly accelerated motion as it occurs down an inclined plane. This should generally apply to balls running down inclined planes with the distance x being proportional to the time squared if the motion starts at rest. One can further conclude that the free fall where the inclined plane is at 90 degrees to the ground, the free fall is an extreme case of the inclined plane and because of consistency balls that fall at 90 degrees should follow the same equation of motion shown on this slide. Thus for the free fall x is also equal to one half a t squared whereby a is equal to gravity. So it reads one half g t squared. As pointed out before the horizontal plane is the other extreme case of an inclined plane. In this case the balls experience no acceleration. The acceleration a equals zero. 
the balls don't necessarily have to start from rest. Considering this situation for the horizontal plane, it becomes apparent that a ball that has been bumped and therefore moves already will not be accelerated by gravity because the plane is horizontal. However, neglecting any friction effects, it will also not stop, so it will run unimpeded forever. This conclusion leads us to Galileo's most important contribution to physics, the inertia principle. Galileo's inertia principle corrects Aristotle's misconceived ideas of motion. Galileo's thinking leading to the inertia principle is illustrated here with these sketches. In these sketches, a downward inclined plane is combined with an upward plane. Neglecting friction and having a symmetric situation as on the top left, where initial height equals final height, the ball running down on the left will run up to the same height on the right. It will only run a small distance to attain this original height. If the situation is modified, as shown next to it, where the upward plane is not as steep, the ball has to run for a longer distance before it reaches the original height. This distance will become longer and longer the less the inclination of the second plane is. In the extreme case of a horizontal second plane, the ball will thus run forever. Galileo therefore concludes that in addition to rest, the uniform unimpeded motion is a natural state of the ball. This is known as the inertia principle. Aristotle incorrectly claimed that any motion needs to be sustained by a force. Indeed, often friction or drag need to be overcome by a force to maintain speed. In that sense, Aristotle was correct. However, neglecting such complex environmental effects such as friction or drag, a much more powerful statement can be made that captures the essence of motion correctly and that is Galileo's inertia principle. In fact, unknown to Aristotle, in space or in vacuum straight, unimpeded motion at constant speed and without any force is indeed realized. The Voyager spacecraft shown on this slide is an example of that. Since it is now very far away from any attractive planets, it does not experience any force and moves on a straight line unimpeded through space. The inertia principle by Galileo Galilei says that an object is inert. It is lazy. It does not require a force to sustain its motion. Instead, it requires a force to change its state of motion. Its state of motion can be rest or it can be uniform straight motion at constant speed. More precisely, one may phrase Galileo's inertia principle by saying an object remains at rest or in a straight uniform motion unless an external force acts on it. So rest or constant velocity are the two options an object has unless a force acts on it. The inertia principle is present in our day-to-day -day lives. That's illustrated by the two experiments that are shown here. Pulling a cloth away underneath a beaker of water or a piece of paper underneath a coin so that it drops into a glass takes advantage of the inertia principle because the force is applied to cloth and paper however no force is applied to the coin or to the glass so they stay where they are. With the obvious consequence that the coin then drops due to gravity into the glass. Galileo arrived at this postulated principle of inertia on the basis of experimentation, using balls running down inclined planes and through careful measurement. It is the consideration of empirical results that was a breakthrough in the development of physics, leading then to Newton's achievements a generation later, when Newton postulated a consistent foundation of the physics at the time namely of mechanics, using 
mathematical language. Galileo demonstrated and pioneered what is now standard in contemporary physics and in fact in all empirical science, namely that theoretical assertions need to be verified using experimentation. In order to do this, three things are required. A concept of experimentation and measurement that also includes measurement uncertainties. A dimensionally consistent system of measurement parameters such as time, distance, velocity, acceleration and mass in this case. And finally, a set of reference standards that permit the comparison of different measurements, measurements carried out by different people and in different contexts. Different systems of parameters and units are possible and have been used in the history of science. However, by convention, the Système International, the SI system, is used. It is based on the three fundamental quantities length, mass and time, measured in meters, kilograms and second. These are fundamental quantities. Additional fundamental quantities are introduced in other areas of physics. Other measurement quantities such as velocity and density that are shown here can be derived from these three fundamental quantities. For example, velocity is defined as distance or displacement over time, x over t, measured in meters per second. Density rho is mass on volume, m on capital V and measured in kilograms per cubic meter. The fact that all derived quantities are composed of the three fundamental quantities expressed in units of meters, kilograms and second is referred to them having consistent dimensions. The concept of dimension is very useful in particular in problem solving and theoretical modeling because it permits a check of the validity of the equations used. We thus say the derived quantity velocity has the dimension length on time. The derived quantity density has the dimension mass on length cubed. This slide shows the results from a series of measurements to determine the density of a steel ball. As with any measurement, it's useful to establish what expectation one might have and look up available data that exists already in appropriate data tables. I've done this here and referenced the source and found that the density of steel is expected to be in between 7.75 to 8.05 grams per cubic centimeters. First I've weighed the steel ball with a scale that has an instrument uncertainty of plus minus 0.5 grams. I obtained four measurement values, 66 grams, 65 grams, 65 grams and 66 grams. It is important to realize that in addition to any instrument uncertainty, there is generally also a measurement uncertainty. In this case, instrument and measurement uncertainty are very similar. The variation between the four values obtained is one gram. So I conclude that combining instrument uncertainty and measurement uncertainty that I've determined the mass of the steel ball to 65.5 plus minus 0.5 grams. In a second step, in order to determine the volume of the steel ball, I've measured the diameter first with a ruler. The ruler has an instrument uncertainty of plus minus one millimeters and I determined that the diameter is 24 plus minus one millimeters. In order to improve experimental accuracy and reduce uncertainty, I've used then a pair of vernier calipers and measured the diameter three times. I obtained the values 24.89, 25.38 and 25.19 millimeters. The vernier calipers I used have an instrument uncertainty of plus minus 0.01 millimeters. 
By looking at the range of measurement values and comparing the three results, I concluded that my measurement uncertainty in this case is equal to plus minus 0 0.3 millimeters, which is more than a magnitude larger than the instrument uncertainty. The reason for this has to do with the fact that it's very difficult to place the vernier calipers accurately on a spherical steel ball. The measurement uncertainty of plus minus 0 0.3 millimeters thus defines the accuracy of the result, which I quote as 25.2 plus minus 0 0.3 millimeters. You note that my result now only contains three figures, 2, 5, and after the decimal point 2, 25.2, whereas the calipers originally gave me results with four figures, 24.89, 25.38, and 25.19. I have limited the quotation of the result to its significant figures. In this case, only three figures are significant, the 2, the 5, and the point 2. This is an important standard of empirical science and it is based on the experimental uncertainty which in this case was determined as 0.3 millimeters. Considering an uncertainty of 0.3 millimeters, quoting further figures following the decimal points like 0, 01 or 0, 0, 001 is insignificant and is therefore avoided. In this case the result is correctly quoted to three significant figures as 25.2 plus minus 0.3 millimeters. It is a common mistake to quote experimental results to more than its significant figures, which can result in misinterpretations of the measurement or the underpinning physics. In order to obtain the volume of the steel ball, first the radius has to be determined from the diameter. I obtain 12.6 plus minus 0 0.2 millimeters. You note that I don't quote the uncertainty as 0.15 but as 0.2 millimeters to be on the conservative side. This is since by convention experimental uncertainties are only quoted to one significant figure unless there is a particular reason to be more specific. The volume is then given by 4 on 3 pi times r cubed which calculates to 8,379.2 plus minus 399 cubic millimeters. Again, I follow the convention that the uncertainty is only quoted to one significant figure, which in this case is 400 millimeters cubed. Consequently, the numerals 7, 9 and 0.2 are also not significant and the result is correctly quoted now to two significant figures as 8400 plus minus 400 cubic millimeters. By dividing the measured mass of 65.5 grams by the measured volume of 8400 cubic millimeters, I obtain a density of 7.8 times 10 to the minus 3 grams per cubic millimeters which corresponds to a result quoted in grams per cubic centimeters of 7.8. Using the rules of error propagation, I also determine that the uncertainty of this value is 0 0.4 grams per cubic centimeter. I have therefore measured the density of this steel ball as 7.8 plus minus 0 0.4 grams per cubic centimeter, which agrees well with the expectation for the density of steel. Since the measured value lies within the expected range quoted on the earlier slide. Because of its importance to empirical science and to measurement in physics, the concept of significant figures is discussed somewhat more on this slide. A significant figure may be defined as that numeral in a result that is still reliably known. Zeros may or may not be significant because zeros are also used to position the decimal point. For example, the result 0 0.0075 meters has not five but only two significant figures because the leading zeros are only there to place the decimal point. This result can be expressed more clearly by using scientific notation 
and quote it as 7.5 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. Now it's clear that the 7 and the 5 are the two significant figures and that the order of magnitude is 10 to the minus 3 meters. In contrast, 10.0 meters, where the two zeros follow the numeral 1, has three significant figures. Since the zeros following the decimal point give information about the reliability of the value as determined by measurement. The last zero, the one following the decimal point, is therefore not superfluous but contains important information. It tells us that the result of 10.0 meters is known to within 1%. Quoting it instead as 10 meters would imply an uncertainty of 10% and quoting it to 10.00 meters would imply an uncertainty of 0.1%. Using scientific notation is generally the best way of quoting results, which is illustrated by the next example. 1,500 meters is ambiguous because it's not clear how many figures are significant. It's better to write 1.5 times 10 to the 3 meters if two figures are significant or 1.50 times 10 to the 3 for three significant figures and writing 1.500 times 10 to the 3 meters is appropriate when four of the figures are significant. The measurement with the lowest number of significant figures determines the number of significant figures of a combined result. In other words, the number of significant figures has to be considered when results from different measurements are multiplied, added, divided, subtracted and so on. That is illustrated with the last example, where two length measurements are multiplied, 25.57 meters times 2.45 meters, which gives the correct result of 62.6 .6 meters squared, quoted to three significant figures, because of the two measurements, one of them, 2.45, is only available to three significant figures, and that therefore also determines the significance of the result. Consequently, when multiplying or dividing several quantities, the number of significant figures in the final answer is the same as the number of significant figures in the quantity having the smallest number of significant figures. In order to be confident of a measurement, it has to be important to be able to reproduce that measurement. That is only possible if standards of units exist. Since 1887, this platinum iridium cylinder, indicated by the red arrow, kept in France, has been the standard for the mass unit 1 kilogram, with replica referenced against it. This standard is however now being replaced with a new concept that is based on kibble balances. Such balances compare electrical and mechanical power. A kibble balance is a complicated instrument that combines measurements of current voltage, local gravity and velocity to arrive at a value for mass. In order to determine a mass m, two modes are used. In a static weighing mode, the weight of the mass is counteracted by a magnetic force. The magnetic force is created through the current that runs through a coil. In the velocity mode, the mass is moved at a certain velocity v through the coil and a Faraday effect is observed. The electromagnetic Faraday effect induces a voltage in the coil that is measured. Furthermore, independently, the local gravity is measured at the location of the kibble balance. By combining the results from the two measurement modes, the values for magnetic field B and the wire length in the coil cancel. Thus measured current times voltage is equal to mass, gravity and velocity. This can be rearranged to give the mass as the product of current and voltage divided by gravity and velocity. The time standard one second can be verified with a similarly complicated instrumentation. Shown are two types of atomic clocks. On the top left a Ramsey type atomic clock and on the bottom right, a cesium fountain type atomic clock. 
the latter type is the state-of-the-art technology that achieves the best precision. Atomic clocks define one second as 9,192,631,770 times 1 over the frequency of one particular hyperfine transition in the atom cesium-133. They achieve this with a precision of 1 in 10 to the 15. Atomic clocks use a principle that was originally developed as a Rabi resonator. It is illustrated here. In a first step, a beam of atoms is in equal numbers in one of two magnetic states. The two states are illustrated at the bottom left of the sketch with an up state and a down state, which correspond to two different magnetic moments, indicated in red up and green down. The up and down state are separated by a very precisely defined energy difference that translates to a transition frequency f. This transition frequency f is the time standard. The beam of cesium-133 atoms passes through an inhomogeneous magnetic field created by a south and a north pole. The magnetic field gradient of this field moves the atoms in the down state with the magnetic moment in green downward out of the beam. This procedure thus selects cesium atoms with the up state of the magnetic moment which pass into the Rabi resonator. Radio frequency electromagnetic waves resonate in the cavity and flip the magnetic moment. The upward red moments turn into downward green moments. The red and green color labels are only for illustration and have no physical meaning. In order to achieve the flip, the frequency has to be very finely set. This achieves the precise definition of the time standard. Using a second inhomogeneous magnetic field on exit, the atoms with a downward magnetic moment, indicated in green, are selected and moved out of the beam towards a detector. If the frequency is set correctly, this detector gives a maximum signal, indicated in the diagram at the bottom right. This signal is exactly at the desired frequency F0, which corresponds to the hyperfine transition in cesium-133. Finally, a feedback loop exists that ensures that the radio frequency F is retuned should it deviate from F0. The definition of the length standard 1 meter is based on the fact that the speed of light in vacuum is constant and independent of reference system. This permits similarly complicated instrumentation using lasers to verify 1 meter. 1 meter is defined as the length of the path traveled by light in vacuum during a time interval of 1 over 299,792,458 seconds. In a teaching laboratory setting, length is typically not measured using laser spectroscopy. However, for example, using the vernier calipers shown at the bottom of this slide. Vernier calipers have accuracies of the order of 10 or 20 micrometers. The vernier scale of a traditional vernier caliper is shown on the right. In this photo the top scale is the actual millimeter scale. The two red markers indicate the vernier reading. The bottom vernier scale has 50 equidistant divisions that are however fitted into 49 millimeters. This means for a zero reading the zero on the bottom scale matches the zero on the top scale and the 10 on the bottom scale matches 49 millimeters on the top scale. The reading shown is 3.58 millimeters. This comes about because the zero on the vernier scale, which is the reference, is in between 3 and 4 millimeters. So the length measured is at least 3 millimeters, but somewhat more. This somewhat more, which is between 0 and 1 millimeters, can be read off the bottom vernier scale. In order to do this, one has to look for matching indicators. In this case, the indicators match at 58. 
therefore the reading is 3.58 mm, with an instrument uncertainty of 0.02 mm. An apple may have a mass of 200 grams. Compare this with the mass of the moon, which is orders of magnitudes larger, or the mass of an electron, that is orders of magnitude smaller. An electron has a mass of 9.10938356 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. The mass of the moon and the mass of the electron differ by 53 orders of magnitude. In order to deal with these large differences, prefixes have been defined that apply to the standard units. They are listed in this table. For large quantities we read deca, hecto, kilo, mega, giga, tera, peta, exa, zeta and iota, whereby iota corresponds to a factor of 10 to the 24. For small quantities we read Deci, centi, milli, micro, nano, pico, femto, atto, septo, and yocto, which corresponds to a factor of 10 to the minus 24. The use of these prefixes has advantages when talking about the results of measurements. However, when writing them down, it is typically better to use scientific notation, since this also emphasizes the significant figures of the value of a particular quantity. While Galileo Galilei introduced a superior understanding of motion, he did not correct Aristotle's misconceived ideas about the concept of force. Placing this blue box with a certain mass m onto this inclined plane, we observe that there are certain forces at work. For example, the gravitational attraction downward, indicated here as F1, as force 1, a normal force pointing perpendicular away from the surface the box is resting on, the inclined plane, indicated as F2, and possibly someone pulling the box upward with the force F3. Considering the plane frictionless, the question arises, will the box with this configuration of forces move? Will it move up? Will it move down? Will the motion be accelerated? Isaac Newton has answered these questions for us. Newton's thinking, that was ultimately published in his book Principia, that is the foundation of modern mechanics and therefore physics, was partly influenced by an inspirational moment, a Eureka moment. There is some historical evidence for this, and the moment occurred in his garden in Woolthorpe, under an apple tree. A contemporary of Isaac Newton reports a conversation with Newton about this moment. He writes, amid other discourse, he told me he was just in the same situation being in this garden as when formerly the notion of gravitation came into his mind. Occasioned by the fall of an apple, he asked, why should that apple always descend perpendicularly to the ground? Why should the apple not go sideways or even upwards? but move constantly, fall constantly towards the Earth's center. He concluded, assuredly, the reason is that the Earth draws it. Therefore, there must be drawing power in matter. One might pinpoint this moment as the moment in history where the law of gravitation was discovered. The mass of Earth draws the apple. Gravitation is a force that is caused by matter. And he theorized further by saying, and the sum of the drawing power in the matter of the earth must be in the earth's center, in the center of mass, not in any side of the earth. Therefore, does this apple fall perpendicularly or towards the center? If matter thus draws matter, it must be in proportion of its quantity. Therefore, the apple draws the earth as well as the earth draws the apple. This can be seen as the discovery of what we now know as Newton's third law, actual equals reactual. If one object exerts a force on another object, the other object will also exert an antiparallel force on the first object. In this case, the mass of earth draws the mass of the apple, and the mass of the apple draws the mass of earth. Newton's thinking goes further because 
He applies these ideas not just to apple and earth, but also to the moon that he might have seen in the sky above him. This is not unusual to us, but it was remarkable at the time, because in Newton's era, people still strictly separated earth and heavens. Inspired in the garden by apple, moon and earth, Newton formalized his ideas using mathematics and in particular calculus. Newton formulated the universal law of gravitation correctly as a force that is equal to the product of the two masses between which that force acts, capital M and little m, divided by the distance squared times a proportional constant which we now call the universal constant of gravitation. Importantly, the large mass pulls the small mass with the same force with which the small mass pulls the large mass in the other direction. So the force is proportional to the product of both masses. The law is called universal because it applies on earth, it applies in space, it applies everywhere. It is universal. Newton demonstrated this universality of this law and therefore the universality of physics with his so-called moon calculation. The calculation addresses the question, does the centripetal acceleration of the moon equal the acceleration due to Earth's gravity at the moon's distance from Earth? The calculation thus compares gravity on Earth, as for example experienced by an apple, m times g, that is little g, mg, with the gravitation experienced by the moon at a larger distance. Newton found that considering the distance as distance squared, gravity is the same for the moon as it is for the apple. Newton's ideas, as formulated in his book Principia, completes our modern understanding of motion and the role of forces in this context. Looking at the development of this understanding of the physics of motion, one might say that Aristotle theorized and speculated on the concepts of motion and force. Galilei complemented theory with experiment and measurement and convinced us that neglecting friction and drag, objects are at rest or in uniform constant motion unless they are affected by a force. We now call this the inertia principle. Newton, as he wrote himself, stood on their shoulders and concluded that physical laws are universal and affect objects on earth and in space alike. Newton described the character of a force. A force by an object onto a second object always entails an equal but opposing force onto that first object. We now call this actual equals reactual. Reducing objects to point masses that are imagined at the object's center of mass and introducing mathematical calculus to physics, Newton also postulated correctly that a force acting onto a point mass changes its momentum through acceleration. We now know this as the second law of mechanics. All three physicists assumed also that time changes uniformly forward and that it is independent of a rectilinear three-dimensional space. This view of the motion of objects, of mechanics, is valid today. Despite the notion of an independence between time and space having been corrected by Einstein in 1905, classical mechanics, as formalized by Newton, is still valid for most of our world for masses that we are familiar with and for velocities that we are familiar with. It only needs to be modified using relativity when masses are huge and velocities approach very closely the speed of light in vacuum. Not the least, this physics of motion can be applied to most human endeavors, such as space exploration, sports physics or micromachines. Newton's work in particular has thus given mechanics a very simple threefold foundation. All mechanics, if on Earth or in the universe, can be explained starting off from these three postulates. 
The first postulated law is the inertia principle. If there is no force, an object is either at rest or in uniform, constant, straight motion. The second law describes the character of force. Force causes momentum change. F is equal to mass times acceleration. Finally, the third law describes the consequences of a force. A force by object 1 exerted on object 2 entails always a force by object 2 on object 1. Action equals reaction. Looking at Newton's laws in detail, one sees quantities such as displacement, acceleration, mass and force. The calculus definition of the motion parameters, displacement, velocity and acceleration is done in the discipline of kinematics. The vector description of force is dealt with in dynamics. And finally, bringing together force and displacement, one can define the parameter work. Work is an energy and adds another dimension to the field of mechanics.